Uh, so I usually don't work, like, actually I don't work on common envelopes, uh, so I don't know if what I'm going to present today has uh, particular relevance, but it's an interesting physics uh, issue that uh, my colleagues and I have been thinking about, um, whether you know, the issue is whether it's possible to have a negative dynamical friction on black holes which are moving through dense medium. So um, this is the conventional, the cartoon of a conventional bondi coil accretion flow where you have um, an object, a compact object, which is moving to the left. So I'm considering this problem in the frame of reference of the compact object. So the compact object here is at rest, and the streamlines are going from left to right. And then the streamlines are bent by the gravity of this object. They collide somewhere behind. They form an overdensity. And this is this overdensity exerts gravitational pull uh, onto this compact object. And so pulling it backwards relative to its motion. Okay, and many people, including people in this room, have investigated this. Now, um, on the other hand, if you don't have an object which is, uh, which is gravitating strongly, but instead is a strong source of wind, and moving supersonically through the, um, through the gas, and this wind will collide with the incoming gas flow and form a bow shock. Okay? Um, so, and you can see immediately the basic idea is that behind the bow shock there is an under density and all of the dense gas is either ahead of the moving object or concentrated in the shell, which, in the mass shell, which corresponds to the bow shock. So, let's look at this picture a little bit more. So, this is the only calculation that uh, we did, uh, which is to consider a particular solution of the bow shock, which was found by Wilkin in 96. And this solution is found in an approximation where uh, the temperature here is zero. So this is a zero temperature approximation, means that the two gas flows, when they collide, they stick to each other. Uh, however, um, the momentum within this shell is conserved. So it's an honest solution in terms of physics. <laughs> and so there, there are two, I mean, it's an idealized physics, but it's an honest physics. So there are three components of gravity, right? One component comes from the uh, gas which is ahead of this uh, shell. The other component is the shell itself, and the third component is the wind. So you can take um, a Wilkins solution, you can analytically find the gravitational force which is acting on this uh, compact object, and you find that there are three regimes. Uh, so the first regime is, so this is, V star is the the velocity of the flow uh, of relative to this compact object. In other words, it's the uh, velocity of the compact object moving through the gas. And then there is V wind, V wind, okay? So when V star is smaller than V wind, the friction is given by this expression, right? And it's actually negative, so it's pointing in the direction of the um, motion of the, so the object accelerates. Uh, so, but not intuitively, when we started, we didn't know that this was going to happen. But when V star actually is faster than, um, significantly faster than V wind, this um, bow shock bends sufficiently that the gravity from the shell actually overcomes the gravity of the material ahead of it. So the friction becomes normal. Okay, the friction is backwards. So it's two regimes. And the crossover happens at about this value. Okay, so this is an analytical solution. This is the only honest calculation which goes into our paper. Um, okay, so then what follows is hand waving and speculation. But um, here we follow a very noble tradition in terms of uh, hand waving and speculation. So this, is, this is a paper which is an amazing paper, actually, by the way. If you haven't read this paper, then I highly recommend that you read this paper. This is a paper about observational appearance of black holes. So these two guys just thought, what's going to happen if black holes accrete a bunch of gas? What, what are possible observational appearances? OK, so you read in the abstract that if, um, the, if there is, you can read the outflowing matter, blah, blah. Supercritical regime of accretion of black hole may appear as a bright, hot, optical star with strong outflow of matter. This is the abstract. And this is in the body of the paper. In, sub in consequence, at the supercritical regime of accretion, the black hole may appear as a lot of a star. And so there is a strong mass outflow with this velocity. They actually give an expression of velocity. I tried to understand the origin of this alpha. I couldn't. Um, so, but I understand all the other scalings uh, that they have here. 
And the basic picture that Shakur and Sunyayev have is that, okay, you have some supply of gas at a super Eddington rate. There is, uh, it's far enough that you can still form a nice thin accretion disk, but at some radius, the photons become trapped, so the disk cannot cool anymore efficiently, so it becomes quasi spherical, and then in order to keep accreting, it has to shed some mass, and the amount of mass that you shed is basically everything, uh, so you have only a small fraction which accretes here onto the black hole. But it is this accretion, because accretion is so effective in releasing energy, it is this accretion which is ultimately the source of the wind, and the wind is indeed given by this kind of expression. Okay? Now, this is the prediction in 1973. In 1976, um, there is a catalog of H-alpha emission stars in the Milky Way, which is published by Stephenson and Sadelec, two astronomers in Case Western University, S and S, right? And this is object number 433, so this is SS433. They found a bright optical star with H-alpha emission, so pretty amazing. Um, now, of course, we know that this is, a, a, it's a, now a standard uh, um, uh, candidate, standard object of black hole, which accretes the super Eddington ray. And I would say if you read through all the observer's papers and reviews, the basic you know, summary of it is that the uh, original idea and original scalings of Shakur and Sunyaev are confirmed. So this object, the, in the wind, you have something like a hundred thousand times the Eddington accretion rate of the black hole at scale. The wind velocity is about 1500 kilometers per second, and they can actually probe different directions because the disk is processing by an angle of 20 degrees, so you have different angles of views. Um, you also have jets, and jets can serve basically as a calorimeter of amount of stuff that goes through the horizon. So by measuring the power in the jets, you do see that only a small fraction of this M dot actually gets to the black hole here. Okay, and one remarkable thing is that people have been measuring this 13.1 days orbital period and it hasn't changed over the last 40 years, even with this huge accretion rate. So, you know, I think it's a remarkable system and not everything is understood about it. Now, in terms of scaling for the wind, this is what we use. It, you know, basically we uh, normalize to what is known about SS433 for all of our estimates. Okay, so the basic picture, and this is like hand waving, uh, is that you have a black hole which moves um, through um, the dense gas, and so some part of this gas accretes, you know, some fraction of the Monty Hall accretion rate goes into this uh, thin disk, and then you have a massive outflow coming from the inner edges of the disk, you know, a massive wind that creates a bow shock in the rest of the uh, whether this configuration actually happens or not, I don't know. Uh, it's one possible one possibility. You can also have possibility where you have limit cycles, where you have periods of accretion which fill the disk, and then the rest of the time the disk blows the wind and creates a bubble. Um, so this condition that the velocity of the wind is greater than the velocity of the black hole moving through gas gives you this type of condition on density. Okay, the interesting parameter here is eta. Eta is a fraction of the bondi hoyle accretion rate which supplies the disk here. And we know from Morgan's work that eta can actually be substantially less than one, even in the um, limit where you don't have feedback. If you have feedback, it may be even less still. So nonetheless, this is the characteristic densities of the outer envelope, okay, of the stuff, okay? So um, the claim is that at densities which are smaller than this value, this picture should work and you should have negative dynamical friction. This is to be tested, obviously, by numerical experiment. Um, okay, so what happens if you have higher densities is even less sure because there are no, you know, unlike, you know, if you call Shakur Sinai's solution, it's a good solution, even though it has never been really confirmed by numerical experiments. Um, what happens at higher accretion uh, rate where this wind is compressed is even less clear but there is a very interesting paper by uh, Eric Kachlin and uh, Mitch Begelman in 2013. This is a so-called zebra solution. So these guys were thinking exactly about the situation where the outflow is suppressed by the inflow. So in particular, if you have something like a TDE, then the radius of circularization is smaller than the radius of the sphericalization of the disk. 
So then they say, basically, you form a quasi-static star around the black hole, and this star processes M dot in such a way that most of it gets to the black hole. And then the creation of black hole drive jets that puncture the star. And basically, they say it's a huge ejection machine, right? So this is, the, this is uh, they wanted to explain uh, some of the jets that are seen from uh, uh, tidal disruption events. Uh, so if this, is, if this is correct, then this is probably great for this idea of negative dynamical frictions, because jets are, first of all, very fast, certainly much faster than the uh, uh, motion of the object to the gas. And they probably inflate large bubbles outside of the Bondi radius. So this is exactly what you need to clear that um, uh, area behind the, um, the end of the moving object. So I would say that there is currently no existing numerical experiments confirming this zebra solution. OK, so this is my last slide. Um, in terms of common envelope, I think it's a possibility, and I want to uh, in this case, comment on Natasha's objection that there is nothing special about the case where you have strong feedback. If you do have uh, some kind of negative friction, then there is a reason why a compact object would park itself on the outside layers, you know, because clearly when the compact object is way outside the star, then the friction is positive. If the claim that when it's inside the star, the friction is negative is correct, then it will tend to park itself always next to the surface layer. So in this case, indeed, you know, the peeling of the envelope would proceed uh, uh, in layers and probably more gradually than the estimates that people here are making. Okay? And an interesting possibility is, in fact, that SS433 is an object which is currently in this machine. That's all. short comment on your last point. I think it's quite surprising that SS433 is in such in this phase for such a long time. I would have expected to go into common envelope phase a long time ago. So you, you agree that there is something special about SS433? Yeah, so I mean, I wonder what's your views on this formation in this environment. I mean, it is it is clear that you know there's certainly a net angle moment, and even in the case where also you're transferring wind and creating binaries. But I think as Morgan showed, and Eric's work also has shown that you know cooling is essential in order to, to form a, a disk in, in, in those situations. And my concern has always been that inside a common environment at this rate, it's, it's hard to find an effective coolant. To, I mean, for, for your case in SS43, it's not clear to me that if you hide the super edits and then you know, this formation will be easy to do. But no. Well, it's certainly, uh, it's certainly something that should be investigated. I thought Morgan simulations form, form the disk around the compound. So we see rotation, but stuff tends to sort of circulate once and then get swept downstream when Ariadna put tracer particles okay. into the flow. And but you still have like one percent of the bond here which gets uh, gets in. Yeah, the, so gas is getting in there, um, but it's never rotationally supported in a sort of structure that's orbiting multiple times. And so I think it'll be really interesting to ask, you know, what is the MHD of that sort of thing where you're sort of constantly sweeping it out? Like, can you amplify fields in the ways that we think are important to these outflows? Um, I think it's not at all obvious. I think another thing that'll be, and this is really wonderful to think about, uh, but I think it'll be really interesting to think about how this interacts with the sort of shape of the spherical shape of the star, where uh, there's a preferential direction for the bubble to expand in, which is sort of outward to where there's less obstacle. Um, so, so I think you'll probably get really interesting and, and, and morphologies in that case, I think. I agree. Of course, all of our arguments are for pure, like, infinite. Yeah. Medium with some angle. No, but that's the place to start. But presumably, there's some transformation there as the, uh, as you go more towards a less uniform environment than the, the bubble that distorts. If you're at the edge, if you're hovering at the edge, I was actually very good. You're a little farther out. 
Today uh, at Rochester, we're interested in common envelope for a lot of different reasons. Um, but we came into it sort of with the interest in planetary nebula shaping. And this is an old, old question. And I want to go through this. I want to show you some new work that we're um, about to publish in collaboration with the uh, Orsula's group. Um, so these are just the, uh, uh, the team that we're working with. So originally, this first work was done by um, uh, Joe in collaboration with Ursula and her student, Thomas. Now, Amy uh, Zhao has taken it. So the question is planetary nebula, which have a wide variety of shapes, but really most of them are bipolar, right? Actually, there's, so this means there's very few planetary that are actually spherical. It's a really vanishing really small amount. And the more when we see spherical, they're really usually we're looking they're cylindrical and we're seeing them uh, way uh, down the waist. Um, but the important thing is that there's a whole class of planetary nebula that are really very jet-like, or they're bipolar and they have these wasp-waisted ones, which is really the, the, the very narrow ways. Um, and then also, as you can see, there's an amazing degree when, you know, if you look through blurry eyes, they look very symmetrical. You have these nice symmetrical lobes, but as your resolution increases, they're not symmetrical at all. And there's this beautiful case of um, uh, OH231, where the, the lobes are actually completely different size. So, you know, that's been something as we've been going through understanding planetary nebula. First, we wanted to understand the bipolar shapes, then the fact that they weren't just bipolar, sometimes they were very jet like. And then the fact that, as we saw with clearer eyes, that there was a lot of asymmetry. Can, can, um, I, ask, can I ask just sorry, Sure. I mean, is it clear that this is a, an intrinsic asymmetry as opposed to like the ISM density is higher? Yeah, you see it. I mean, it's pretty intrinsic in the sense. You see it across so many different cases. Also very internal, right? It's not just at the edges. It's also, you see the, you see this asymmetry in blobs that are very deep in the lobes themselves. So this idea, so this is one of the things I just want to impress upon you, which for me is very exciting. This idea of shaping a planetary nebula by common envelope goes way back. In the 80s, it's people like Gnome and Mario Livio and Mark Morris. Oh, look, you know, if you have a binary, they're going to eject mass preferentially in the uh, orbital plane. And you know, then if you drive a wind into it, you'll be able to do some shaping. And this is paper that Vincent Eka, this is when I was a graduate student, did, showing that you could get very strong collimation out of having a donut of gas around, you know, that, that uh, you first eject a donut, probably from the binary, then you'd have a fast wind from the uh, uh, whatever, you know, interior here there. And you can see this is actually shows a simulation where you get a very, it's very old, right? This was, we were like, yay, 128 by 128 resolution. And you can see that the, do the donut was controlled by some ad hoc density fun function. Here it looks much more like a cord apple. This is the ejecta. And you drive a wind into that and you would get a jet. And one of the important things about the jet was, you know, there's always a two shock structure with this. You drive a wind into an environment and you get an uh, outer shock expanding outward, sweeping up the ambient medium. And then there's an internal shock um, 
which is where the wind is being decelerated. And if it becomes elliptical, then the, because it's an oblique shock, material from the free expanding wind hits it and is redirected into a jet. So we were very excited about this paper by that Harold Melamon and I did just after we, grad, after we got our PhDs. Um, we spent a lot of time, so Q here is the ratio between the mass in the pole and the mass in the equator of the ambient medium. And as you see, as Q increases, 3, 7, 14, 30, you first of all get something that's much more jet-like, but also it's hard to see here, but you, you're getting a more elliptical inner shock. We spent an enormous amount of time in this paper trying to figure out the hydrodynamics of that. Um, so, okay, so this is the background. We've been thinking about this for a long time, and what's remarkable now with common envelope evolution is we are actually able to get this, right? This, this was ad hoc, this density distribution, and I want to show you now the consequences. And this, this, this uh, paper that I'm about to show you, which is, uh, you know, we're just finishing up, um, is, you know, it's very much a physics experiment, but it captures the, uh, the essence of what we think of what's going on. And what we're doing is we're starting from a simulation, a, a, an SPH simulation that Ursula and Thomas did, here is the density distribution. You see the size scales, you know, on the order of 400 AU. Um, starting off with a uh, 0.8 mass red giant, a 0.39 uh, core of that, a 0.6 mass companion, and the final separation ends up at uh, 20 uh, should be stellar uh, or solar radii. What you see is you get this big extended envelope. You also get some, you know, because the evolution is going on, they've let this run for a while that the ejecta is um, expanding. But the important thing to see here is this very dense torus in here. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this SPH simulation, you know, allow our AMR code, AstroBear, to digest it, run it for a little bit longer, and then right at the center there in a little sphere, we're going to inject a spherical wind. Yes. You're doing this uh, in 3? 3D. With the, the 3D SPH initial image. Yeah. So we're taking the 3D SPH condition, initial condition and, and then bring it into the 3D AMR. So there was a quite a bit of work that Joe had to do in order to get the code to be able to accept this. We're going to do four runs, a high momentum case and a low momentum case for the wind, right, for the spherical wind. Now, of course, so the, you know, the, uh, the um, uh, common envelope evolution is completely self-consistent, right? But now what's not self-consistent is we're just going to add at the, you know, in, in the beginning of our simulations, a, um, a spherical wind that is either going to have high or low momentum, meaning mass loss rate. A uh, high case is going to be 10 to the minus 4, low case is going to be 10 to the minus 5. In all cases, the wind speed is going to be 300 kilometers per second, which is about appropriate for the escape velocity of, uh, you know, of this. Maybe the binary merged, maybe you've got a, you know, maybe you've got um, uh, one of the binary, or the primary or secondary producing a, a wind. You know, we're not asking, that's a black box for these simulations. We're also going to see what happens with radiative cooling in the outflow or not radiative cooling. Um, in general, we would expect radiative cooling to occur in these cases, but it was important just to sort of get a sense of how uh, these uh, outflows work. So we can talk about the initial conditions more if anybody's interested. Given the time, I'd like to go right on to the simulation. So this is our case of high momentum, no radiative cooling. The white outline here, or the white contour shows, is, is coming from the temperature, really shows you the outline of the outflow. And you can see, the, first of all, the most amazing thing is from this little teeny tiny, you know, uh, condition there where we're driving the wind, you get these beautifully highly collimated outflows. Okay, so um, uh, this is, I think, about uh, 3,000 days approximately of evolution, um, and you see three, two important things. One is beautiful amount of collimation, um, becoming somewhat self-similar in the sense that the shape is not really changing. Uh, in terms of the aspect ratio, but you do see um, uh, uh, asymmetry between top and bottom, right? The, the flow that's happening here is not the same as the flow that's happening there. So that's already an important thing to understand that the, the nature of the, since the um, common envelope, you know, what was left from the common envelope wasn't symmetric. We don't expect the outflows that we're driving to be symmetric, even though we're driving a symmetric wind, right? It's a fully uh, spherical wind. The temperature tells the story of some very interesting hydrodynamics happening here. So um, uh, uh, the temperature what you're seeing here is at the top of the lobes material that has been you know that has been shocked as it sweeps up the ambient medium. So very high temperatures there as you'd expect. But notice also these um, uh, elliptical, highly elliptical shaped regions of lower temperature. Basically, what you're getting here, and we're going to see as we go to the end, that you're getting uh, the, down here the wind 
The spherical wind is being redirected into a jet, which has some opening angle, and as it expands, it cools, and then when it runs into this material here, it's shocked again. So you're getting sort of multiple redirecting shocks in these flows, uh, which is something that really, in some sense, we had already seen or predicted back with these those very low resolution simulations uh, back in 96. This is the case of low momentum and no cooling. And what you see here is similar to what's happening before. But if you look carefully, you'll notice this, the, the southern lobe is not as extended as the northern lobe. And there's quite a bit more uh, asymmetry between top and bottom. Um, so in this case, the, in the low momentum case, the outflow has, to, has a harder time pushing through the um, cord apple, right? So the, 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 the uh, common envelope distribution, really, it's like a very narrow nozzle that you're driving the spherical wind into. And the wind is uh, sensitive to any inhomogeneities or top-bottom asymmetries that were imposed just by the, the, the chaotic nature of the common envelope evolution. And you see that reflected in the outflow. So there's more asymmetry in these uh, simula. In the low momentum case, there is in the high momentum case. So as you, you, know, you imagine, as you crank down for even lower momentum case, you'd have, you know, it's possible that you get just, you know, one lobe uh, uh, emerging or one lobe emerging in a very different way. Now, if we add cooling, what is happening with the radiative? So when we talk about cooling, what am I talking about? We have a cooling curve, standard way of doing this. Every cell gets, uh, we look at the density and the temperature and then go to a standard cooling curve here. I believe we're even using Del Grano McRae, very old cooling curve. But basically the idea is optically thin. We, re we refrigerate that gas. Um, and so what you see, the, of course, the shocks respond to this. The shocks become, uh, they lose energy. In some sense, they become more brittle. Uh, they, they're more subject to various kinds of instabilities that can happen, both at the shock head and the contact discontinuity. Um, but still, you still see now, what you see is an even more narrow jet uh, emerging from these uh, conditions, or these cases, than we had before, which makes sense because there's less thermal energy, there's less lateral extension, expansion. But still, the um, uh, the overall height in Z is about the same. So you're still getting the ram pressure is still doing its work. Uh, here is the temperature, uh, again, in this case. And you see that instability sort of that are forming at the edge, which is exactly what we'd expect. Um, uh, these are both cooling instabilities and um, uh, thin shell instabilities. Um, so a lot more substructure. And now if we go to the um, low momentum uh, cooling uh, case, now you see something really interesting. Uh, look, the bottom lobe is significantly different in uh, size than the upper lobe. And what it really tells you is just some, you know, there's something about what the, how the bottom uh, apple core formed that is allowing, that is making it more difficult for this material to uh, 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 blow out of the inner region. So I think that I found that to be very satisfying, very interesting. Um, here's the thing that's really remarkable for someone who's been spending their whole life doing uh, outflows and uh, you have these kind of win-win uh, interactions. Way down here, notice the size scale here, 100 AU. Down here at 1 AU, there is that conical inner shock that you know, Vincent and, and uh, Harold and I found in those totally low resolution simulations. There's this little tiny you know, eyeball shaped shock, which is redirected. This is Mach number, by the way. As you can see, this, this is high, these are high Mach number flows. As you'd expect, the wind expanding away from the central region, then being redirected into these jets, right? So you see this very strong shock-focused inertial confinement, something we talked about 20 years, 25 years ago. Um, you get these jets, which themselves are now, uh, um, they're, they're supersonic, but they are going to expand. There's enough thermal energy in them that they're still going to do some expansion. And they will once again become even, they'll become hypersonic, and then form those uh, larger elliptical-shaped shocks, um, uh, like here. OK, so that was to me amazing that, you know, now factors of 100 now uh, were able to increase in size scale. And we see the little tiny uh, shock focused inertial confinement. One last thing just to point out here is the uh, asymmetries. So this is, these plots show top and bottom uh, lobes for the, uh, the, uh, the different cases, model A, B, C, and D. This is the low, this is the cooling low momentum, cooling high momentum, et cetera. And what you see is there's really um, uh, the, there's a, quite a bit more asymmetry just in terms of how far they get. Clearly, the, uh, the low momentum case, the, one of the lobes is tiny, the other lobe is huge. 
this is a measure of asymmetry in terms of we looked at the second, we looked at the cross section, how much cross sectional area there was in the top lobes, but looking at the, the uh, uh, about one third of the way up and two thirds of the way up for top and bottom lobes. And this gives you a measure that, you know, there's the, the, the lobes, are, you know, as we can see visually, the lobes look different. Um, which is exactly what we see in the observation. So this is very, very promising in the sense that we're seeing everything come out of the common envelope evolution that we need in order to explain things that have been quite mysterious to us for uh, an understanding protoplanetary nebula. That really we certainly nail the, the collimation. We're getting the instabilities or the, the asymmetries. And we're getting most of all these gross asymmetries and the possibility of that in the sense of one lobe will be very different. Uh, in terms of even size from the other. So uh, I'll end there, and I thank you very much. Time for a few questions. So inside the, inside the flow, uh, you seem to have almost like sharp diamonds, it looked like, and not, not quite, but I was wondering, are those kinds of structures visible? I mean, can that explain some of the small scale structure you see in the in some cases, it might be. M29 is an example where you really see what appears to be about midway up through the lobes. You see these brightened features. So I think, you know, I mean, it's uh, one, you know, in, when you look at it, you're like, oh my god, that's it. And then sometimes when you look at the kinematics and such, or the, or the uh, ionization structures, it kind of goes away. But I think, you know, certainly some of these things, some of that knotty structure, maybe not the shock diamonds, but the, 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 Inhomogeneities in that are being developing in the flow, I think, are I think those are going to be well matched to what we see in the observations. Sam, um, oh, this is really interesting. I, I guess you're doing this all without any magnetic fields, which is always right. a big a big accomplishment. Uh, but what I'm curious about is the <clears throat> this wind that you introduce uh, at a certain phase, uh, all of a sudden. Uh, and it, it, presumably, if it's a common envelope, the star is kind of peanut shaped. And why would it have a spherical wind? Well, it's not, I mean, again, so that black box, right? I mean, okay. you know, we literally put a spherical distribution around there. You know, maybe there's a accretion disk around one of them, and it's a wide angle width, right? You know, if it's already a jet, case over, right? But we want no, to I, hear. I was trying to make it not a jet, but, but something that comes from a non-spherical star. But again, we don't really, you know, we, we so much don't know what is at the bottom in there, right? Maybe it's a merged star. And, the, you know, there's there's the standard idea, you know, for that, that people have been using for planetary nebula, that a post-AGB object they'll model as a, you know, a, a 10,000 degree, you know, star. And that's, you know, it seems to the spectra kind of match that, right? It's a proposed AGB object. So who knows what's in there? So we were, again, now that's why I'm saying this is kind of an experiment, you know, a physics experiment more than we're trying to directly trying to match something. I mean, it's a okay. proof of principle that since the sphere is the worst possible case right. for ultimate collimation, if you put in the sphere, then sure. you get accomplished. That's yeah. Well, and that, that would well not necessarily, because if you had a peanut star, you might not get very much mass off the pole. Yeah, oh, that's okay. well, no, but if you know what, if that's the case, then it's still going to get redirected. You're still going to, you know, I mean, you know, okay. that's the thing. As long as you're getting any mass, yeah. I mean, yeah, I think that question, I think if you had something that was maximally in the uh, equator, you still might find, it might be an experiment to do. We should try yeah, that. I still think you're going to get it redirected. Good luck. I have uh, one comment, one question. Uh, first of all, those uh, pressure confinement shocks and reclamation shocks look extremely similar to right, uh, jets you get from compact objects and stellar envelopes and like, extensive literature, and I'm sure it's the same uh, idea there. Um, second of all, and Brian and I had a, a paper on predicting on what would be the observed temperatures of these uh, radiative shocks, and I was wondering, observationally, in these uh, outposts from the, the nebulae, do you uh, see actually temperatures where we get a maybe from those well, from to the five or actually lower temperatures? Um, the temperatures for pro for protoplanetary nebulae before ionization, because once ionization kicks in, everything's going to be 10,000 degrees, right? But for um, uh, for protoplanetary nebula, where you know there, there hasn't been significant ionization from the central object, I believe you're getting temperatures at the at the levels of tens of thousands of degrees, which is sort of what you'd expect for you know for a cooled 300 kilometer per second wind. Other people can. Correct me if there's any other planetary nebula observers here, but I believe that the, the observations, you know, things are being lit up there by shock excited emission. So, you know. Yeah, because we had a prediction that in radiative shocks are actually going to be emitting at lower temperatures than the jump conditions give you. That's it. And, of course, 
What? Unless there's a stand that also found this. Yeah. But that's okay. Yes, I mean, I, I would expect that as well, just because of the jump condition. I mean, if you're using a gamma equals one shock, okay. Yeah. But if it, but in reality, of course, you know, there's there's actually cooling going. But you know, you have to track what's going on behind the shock. So I wouldn't be surprised that you're getting lower than the, the jump condition. So Morgan and Natasha. Um, so I'm curious about in this kind of controlled experiment. It's wonderful that you know the momentum that you're putting in. Right. So then, have you asked yet? how much of that momentum is vented towards the poles versus directed to that torus. It, 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 and I, I think what I'm getting at is like, do we know uh, over what time or if that torus is sort of ablated by this process? Yeah, we haven't looked at that yet. That's actually a great question. I mean, I think the problem is, is that the torus is so dense, like the polar equator contrast yeah. here is factors of thousands, you know, so that it's, it's like really the stuff just you know, just leave. So I don't. So is that saying that like almost all of the injected momentum yes, is yes, going to yes, the poles? Yes, it's going into the poles. Yeah, yeah. 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 As so opposed we, to blocking off and just blocking off the equator, just take selecting the momentum from above is actually redirecting. Redirect. Yeah. Right. Which is why I think stands your question. If yeah, you had a, if awesome. your wind was completely in the equator, it would still end up in yeah. the poles. It's got nowhere to go essentially. You know. I'll see. But we should look. I mean, we haven't looked. You know, that, that we haven't gotten to that point. Yet. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I have a question. So your black box with those properties. To what kind of post common envelope remnant it physically must cause? I think it's you know these mo these numbers are reasonable for a you know like a, a post AGB object like if you're making a model of a post AGB object you know climbing up the, the learning curve so I think that you know the the 300 kilometers per second or so so, you know, is, is reasonable for, you know, an object with this kind of mass. Uh, the mass loss rates may be more difficult to get out of post-AGB object, but they are very much in line with what we see from the Bakara ball, you know, at all results. If you're looking at the energetics, you know, Bakara ball has looked at all of these post-AGB <coughs> collimated flows, and what they infer from the observations is certainly mass loss, mass loss rates like this. Last question or something. So there's actually one more comment to Natasha, one real caveat here. So the common envelope we gave Adam is a non-ejected common envelope. So you tell usual 10% out and the rest is kind of going, but it's coming back, right? So if you can get the post-AGB, well, the core, to do that wind when we eject it, which is about 3,000 days after, yeah. you know, we give it 3,000 days to get its act together, and then the fast wind goes, right? If that is realistic, which it might be, then this is what happens. But if we instead we have a situation with a, a longer phase, thermally regulated phase afterwards, with the envelope having to adjust, the star's not yet a post AGB star, still an AGB star, star still got its envelope, the binary is in there, so there's going to be something else happening, then whatever 10% was ejected at the beginning is going to be gone. Whatever else is going to be more diffuse. So suddenly the shape around your fast wind at the time of initiation is going to be different. So that's actually one big unknown, and it all, is all related to the ejection property of the common envelope. And that's the future of this, I think. Yeah, that's like, look at more. So we took thing. one yeah. common envelope outcome. I think now look you know, more broadly. Because I think, you know, messing with the initial, the, uh, you know, the, um, the, the, the collimation of the interior of, uh, may not be that interesting because already putting in a jet, who cares, right? But I think certainly mass loss rates, as you start to yes. crank down the momentum, you know, are you just going to bubble away? You're just going to produce bullets, which is sometimes you see, like, every now and then you're going to be able to drive your way out of it. Um, but also to see the common envelope, you know, the different common, different common envelope outcomes will provide different kinds of nozzles or no nozzle at all. So I think that is actually a place where, you know, some there, there is a question here, I mean, with the, with the momentum that's put in at a time, it's basically chosen to be like a thousand times the radiative, a thousand times the solar luminosity, which is like the radiative luminosity of the mm -hmm. NGB, or that's why it's spherical. And there may be issues with the collimated <coughs> momentum in some variable objects, which would suggest that you would need another source of momentum, like accretion or something. So this is limited by the max. Okay, I think we should uh, just close on that. Uh, thank all the speakers again. Uh, so